All right, so I guess that's my cue. And uh, welcome, uh, very happy to be here, Global Fact 8. And uh, yeah, so I am Fintan O'Donnell and I'm from the Open Data Institute based in London in the UK. Uh, with me are Andy Dudfield from Full Fact, also in the UK, uh, Pablo M. Fernandez, he's based in Argentina, he's with Chequiado, fact checking agency, um, and Kate Wilkinson from Africa Czech, uh, usually based in South Africa, but currently in uh, the UK as well right now. Um, and so this, so what will happen within these uh, 45 minutes is I'll kind of give a little like overview, little intro to the topic, and then we'll go to a kind of round table chat, and then we'll have some uh, for a while, and then we'll have some uh, questions from you at the end, questions and also feedback, um, experiences you had with your use of national statistics in fact checking. So um, to start off, um, yeah, so it uh, obviously fact checkers, they use data sources uh, to verify the truth of claims um, from many, many sources, uh, government departments, health services, academic papers, surveys. So these all make up what's known as the national statistical system in the country. And but this particularly focuses on uh, our, our work uh, on the uh, data statistics published by national statistical organizations or sorry offices pardon me um who would be kind of the main uh, statistical body in the country um you almost certainly have one in your country uh, so for instance there is statistics south africa in south africa obviously the office of national statistics in the uk there is the institute for national statistics and the census in argentina um, India has its uh, Ministry of Statistics and Program Implementation. Um, yeah, and uh, interestingly, uh, in the US, though, it, that, that job is split amongst many um, uh, statistics offices. So just to give a bit of background of where, why, this, why we're working together and why this project exists, um, yeah, it's a collaboration between uh, us four organizations, and it's part of a three-year project funded by Google.org, who are the philanthropic uh, wing of Google. And it's part of the AI impact challenge. And there's two main parts to it, and we'll talk about one. Uh, so one part is developing technology which uh, to help automate or build tools um, for fact checkers. And the other, which we're looking at, is creating guidance and trying to improve national statistics data such that you know, fact checkers can do their work easier and quicker, but also it's easier to build the software tools on top of them. Um, obviously, I mentioned us, but I should also mention that uh, uh, the other people in full fact in our organizations obviously have been helping out. So, like, if you take the kind of um, work of like a fact checkers process, right? And you kind of so they kind of go through their work of verifying a claim. It's so they'll decide where they're checking. They'll check the claims context. They'll find. That, but a big part of it is finding the source data and kind of checking that source data and then kind of representing that source data to audiences. Right. And um, so you can kind of see that like a big part of it, like you can't check claims unless they exist and you can be massively slowed down if like national statistics are uh, hard to find or not very, uh, not very dependable. So a lot of our work was um, kind of surveying national statistics offices around the world and the data they publish. Um, we tried to be uh, relatively broad in the ones we we're looking at, but we'll admit our kind of slightly own bias in that uh, we're limited by, well, I'm limited by my uh, mostly just being able to speak English. And um, so um, the ones we kind of uh, talk about or, or show or look at um, were mainly English based, but sometimes other languages as well. And we're not out to kind of ever like uh, name or shame any kind of uh, um, national statistics or uh, office. Um, it's more just we're kind of trying to provide guidance or help to kind of improve the situation everywhere, regardless of how many how much resources they have. We believe like that better data publishing by these is doable by everyone. If it, even if it's just simple steps, that's 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 doable, and often it's it's not like not expensive. It's not hard to do this, uh, but simple steps can make a big uh, big difference. So I'll kind of break down like a few, just quickly, a few different parts of, uh, I'll just go over those few parts of the fact checking process and how they're affected by data, right? The quality of data. So first off, you have to choose what to ver choose what you verify. So lots of claims are made but in, 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 uh, in, in the media, uh, social media, and, um, but you have to kind of know what statistics exist in your country. And so that kind of depends on your NSO making it clear what data they actually have. Right, so someone claims that uh, inflation has gone to two percent this last quarter. 
but your inflation data only comes in once a year. You can't that can't be fact checked, right? Um, also knowing the limits of that data and also knowing knowing what NSOs exist. Um, so next step that will be affected is obviously finding it. So is it easy to search for these, both using external search engines and the search on the website? Is it easy to navigate through those websites? Um, I'm sure every fact checker has kind of done this, probably spent quite a lot of time, maybe wasted a lot of time trying to find this. But these are all design choices by NSOs and how they publish data as well. Um, also having humans available to help um, as well can, can really make, make a massive difference. Uh, next up, in terms of data choices or data publishing, is accessing data. So fact checker, right? They'll depend. So data could be published. It could be inside a PDF or an Excel file or stuffed inside some hundred-page report. And so all these choices, all these formats, they really do make a difference in what can be done with that data. And um, if it's in an image, is that is the data set available? Is that is that easy to find? And um, do they publish in CSVs? Um, and then maybe uh, kind of in more, um, maybe further down the line or more advanced um, NSOs might have application programming interfaces, which are APIs, which are basically ways you can use software to pull data out of databases without having to go through websites. And we're quite interested in it because it makes it easy to build, um, to build software on top of that, which can help the fact checking process. So next up, and there's also analysis as well. So obviously NSOs provide analysis of, they don't just present raw data sets. They also have reports with that. They'll provide visualizations. They'll, sometimes those are just simple images. Sometimes they're interactive visualizations. Sometimes they'll include video. Um, and all this is kind of giving context to numbers. So sometimes that context provided by the NSO is good, good quality and can be used by the fact checker. But sometimes the, the fact checker has to create their own analysis as well. And so again, if they, if you have to kind of bring something into Excel and then start building some graphs, if those, if that data is sitting in a PDF, say, and you have to copy and paste all those tables in, I mean, that, that like really slows down the fact checking process, which um, I guess we all know uh, uh, time is like very important in this. And um, a big thing um, when we interviewed fact checkers and kind of saying, what's most important to you? within national statistics offices and how they publish data. A huge thing was being able to contact them, like uh, saying, um, being able to contact them and like just being reliable. It doesn't matter if it's like phone or email or whatever other form, social media. It just like, please have some dependable person there that we can contact and we can get information about, does this data set exist? Can you please do extra analysis? Um, who, you know, who should I talk to? I, often it can be quite, sometimes um, a data set might be up, but you don't know which person in the in the statistics office you even have to talk to about it. You might be, so you might get through the front desk and then pass through three people, all this slows down or whatever. Um, and then last point, um, and then we'll kind of go to the uh, talk uh, round table is um, lastly, it's in referencing data. How like, so? Obviously, uh, the fact check fact checker will be kind of um, presenting this data or presenting this information to the readers, and so they kind of have to say they kind of have to present the data, present the analysis, or and then also present kind of the context around that data. And is it easy to reference? And how they have to choose? You know, do I? I'll, I'll they'll link to the data, but do they link to the data set itself, the report with the data, the the page with the website with the data? Um, how is this referencing done? And so these kind of this question also exists as well with this. Um, what, so lastly, I'll say um, so we're kind of creating guidance, kind of expanding on all this. Um, we're kind of a, a, a short report, short approach report, uh, but also um, a kind of um, annotated like slide deck as well for much more easier browsing. Kind of showing these examples um, much more in detail and kind of going much more into the topic. I kind of the ultimate aim there really is to kind of help um, fact checkers maybe kind of accept that um, that your NSO just exists and the way they publish data is just the way they're always going to publish data. But fact checkers can really they're hugely impactful users of national statistics, which um, national statistics offices are always looking for and maybe don't appreciate enough and kind of. Um, 
should be building up better relationships with fact checkers because fact checkers obviously make these statistics get to work. They get those, they get that data out there and making impact in society. And so it's about building that relationship up, but it's also importantly about kind of advocating, oh, can you please um, do this next uh, do, doable step, just like say our neighbor country or some other country um, do and um, that kind of such that everyone can kind of move forward and create like, create better published data, basically. Um, yeah, so if um, you can, I'm sure there's many ways to contact me through this or any, any of our pal panel members. And if you want to find out more about this topic or want to see or comment on the first draft of our guidance around this, uh, then do please uh, get in contact. Um, so that's my little, little, little spiel. And uh, I will now kind of open the, it for to the rest of the panel. And kind of ask um, ask them uh, one say say uh, thanks 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 for coming nice to see you folks again and uh, also just do you have any examples where like the access to NSO data in your country has like they've done certain improvements that you've really noticed or it's really like helped your work and so if so what were those improvements and uh, how did it help your work. Should I jump in here, Fintan? You can completely jump in, yes. Yeah. Hi, everyone. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be with you this afternoon. As Fintan said, my name is Kate Wilkinson, and I'm the Deputy Chief Editor at Africa Check, uh, which was the first fact-checking organization in Africa. And we have uh, offices and teams working in four countries. So we have a team in South Africa, Kenya, Nigeria, and Senegal, where we use those bases to cover the region and fact-check important claims in public debate. And I think the first point really for me to make is I think Africa Check is in quite a unique situation in that it operates in a number of different countries. Uh, so this is a pro because we get to experience a lot of different NSOs. We get to see different ways of operating, different formats of releasing statistics, and we can learn what is good. Uh, but it's also a bit of a con because in some of the countries where we work, we do have difficulties and struggles in accessing uh, not just good quality um, data, but also information about that data. So in the beginning, when we first started operating, we were first based in South Africa. Um, so this experience relates to, to that country, but it also speaks to the others. And I'm sure everyone listening to this talk and my fellow panelists will have shared this experience is that Often when you set up a fact-checking organization in a country, no one really knows what it is. I think maybe that is decreasing um, because fact-checking has become a much larger global movement and more people know about it. But in the early days, our experience was that they didn't know what the hell we wanted from them. You know, we'd ring them up. Were we researchers? Were we journalists? Um, were we trying to cause problems? You know, OK, we'll give you the data on access to water. But why are you asking all these questions about the survey and the sampling and the questions that were asked? So a lot of it is actually engagement and education around the work that we do so that there's actually a common understanding about what we want, what they can provide and how we're going to use it. Um, so that's really the groundwork that has to be set up, whether you're working in South Africa or Kenya or Nigeria. Um, and then just to add to that, you know, a relationship really is an ongoing thing that you have to nurture. And what we have found to be incredibly um, beneficial and worthwhile is once you get the stats and you publish the fact check, that's actually where you get to enrich the relationship and actually show the NSOs the good that their work is doing. And that means getting back in touch with the subject specialist or the communications person and thanking them for their assistance and saying, this is what we did. A person made this claim about this important topic and it was false. And we used your, da your data to, to show that. And this is the impact that it's had. And through the months and years of that sort of relationship, there's an understanding about what you're each trying to do and what you can do together. Um, great, thanks, Case. Um, can I jump in? Or, yeah, or, of course, Pablo, fire away. Yeah, okay. Now, just to add to Kate, um, just in case, thanks for the invitation and thanks, Fintan, for the, for the the presentation, the introduction. I'm Pablo Fernandez. I'm from Chequiado in Argentina. 
and the your your question resonates with us because we when when Chicago started 11 years ago the the institution of national statistics was uh, not creating good statistics at all actually it was like in some way not not the real inflation not the real unemployment so for us it's really important this small thing that I know you guys know, but for the audience, it's interesting that during this project, we changed the government and the, the database keep the same. <laughs> that small step for us is very important. And that the API that was created by the previous government is still maintained by this government that is from a different party. That small thing for maybe for a developed country, for us is something that we celebrate and actually, we, we talk with the government just to say that we are users of that, that we are users of this and that we really need this API to keep working and maybe improve in the future. But we were really afraid when the government changed that there was some problem there and it's not. So I'm, I'm great with that. Um, Pablo, can I just ask uh, why data would change between different governments? What what's their view of it? Is it a sense of ownership, or why would uh, why would that happen? Or yeah, in some ways, a sense of ownership, and in the other way, uh, usually, um, actually, the statistic is something very political in Argentina. So when the when the government change, the the thing is that usually sometimes. Sometimes the, the way the, the statistics is measured change. That is not the way that it's supposed to be, but it happens. Uh, so the idea is that that's, that's why we celebrate this. And it also sometimes the people in charge of the statistics change. So it's not like a technical position, but a political position. So that's why we are celebrating this small step. Um, great, thanks, Pablo. And um, Andy, I can I can maybe ask something else, but uh, or unless you want to um, uh, add to that, or I might just add, what's your thoughts? Um, I think I guess I can give a quick outline of some of Fullfact's work with uh, statistical offices. So Fullfact has been going for about ten years or so um, in the UK, and um, we have spent a lot of time in that uh, working with statistical offices, and perhaps. Uh, I'm relatively uniquely placed in that I used to work for a statistical office and now work for a fact checker. So I have this kind of bridge between the, the, the two worlds. And I think we've tried to, full fact has tried to engage with the statistical community in a number of different ways. Um, partly that is through wider systems of feedback. So being involved in things like economic systems um, and to uh, feedback in statistical community. Um, so that's helping to influence things like making sure that statistics are presented in such a way that they really describe the the world of the everyday person a good example of that is the um, gender pay gap so disparity between gender and pay in the uk statistics setup that was put into a set of statistics called the annual survey of hours and earnings which is a very dry kind of topic but inside that there was some really interesting societal information so Full fact and others um, influenced to try and ensure that there was a conversation about making that content easier to discover. Um, there was also a collection of work around the governance of statistical systems. So full fact fed into the UK statistical authorities um, revision of its code of practice a few years ago. But I think some of the most positive things have been in some, some of the smaller changes as well. Um, so one of the things that um, I was particularly interested in is things like um, better explanation of margin of error in statistical data. So ONS, the statistical office in the UK, did some good work, I think, to add fuzzy lines to charts to show where there was a possibility of a margin of error. And that's just really helpful in explaining the context of some particularly hard to work with numbers, which were around um, um, immigration. Um, also, uh, we've, we've done some work to make sure that correction notices, so making sure that caveats and contexts are added to statistics have been more prominently displayed. One of the key things is if a set of statistics has been updated after as a fact check, just making sure that it's very obvious that the statistics had a methodology change or have been revised in some way to make sure that that journey is completed. And I think one of the things that probably has been the most useful um, is one of the things that Finton referred to in his earlier remarks of about that ease of contact. 
I think one of the things that the statistical office in the UK has done most successfully, and I think it's been most helpful, is they have an individual contact on every statistical release that is published. So there was always an email address of a person. And that probably has been one of the most helpful things in ensuring that we can quickly and easily engage with the statistical office, get to the right people and ask the questions we want. And I have thoughts on much wider technology things and the data parts of this, which I'm sure we will get to, but that small choice, that individual choice to say there is somebody that you can always refer to has been an incredibly powerful way for us to build that relationship with our statistical office. And Fintan, sorry, can I just jump in here and just um, just give a different perspective from the work that we do? So I think I can actually share two very different experiences that we've had when it's come to working with NSOs and that point of contact and the experience of that relationship. So in South Africa, where I have worked, um, our national stats office is called Statistics South Africa, and we have a really good relationship with them, and they have a very open communication structure. So you can go through the communications person, the media office, they'll help you, they'll speak to a subject specialist, but all of the subject specialists' contact details, email addresses, phone numbers are listed on the website. So you can phone someone directly and you can ask them a question, and they are all allowed to speak to the media and give answers. Answers. And we even have really great people who are amazing allies who will email us at 2.30 in the morning because they've just finished their work and they're finally getting to our question and they just do amazing work to help us. But in comparison, um, uh, some of our work in Nigeria can be much more difficult because the communication structure of that national statistical office is so different. There is only one person who is allowed to speak to the media or speak to fact checkers. No subject specialists are allowed to, and every communication has to go through that one person. And often that person's role, you know, doesn't really fit to the very technical questions we want to ask. You know, we want to just have a 10 minute chat with the person who put together statistics about how many kids are out of school. And we want to ask them how they calculated it, what was the sampling, how do they define out of school, etc. And that could be a 10 minute conversation or it could be a two week back and forth with the one person who you're allowed to speak to. Um, and that just shows how the the constraints with which you're working can have such an impact on the fact checking and whether you can change those is debatable but it's it's really something you have to be cognizant of and keep in mind when you're approaching these engagements um thanks very much kate um i will uh there's a couple of questions actually coming in i might just take those now um dan brickley asked uh, hi dan um uh, is Google data set search useful for assisting fact checking process or are we mostly concerned with well known official statistics? Is there a role in fact checking for searching across all of the data sets in the world? Um, so it was interesting. I was looking, I did a bit of poking around and kind of seeing for it, like not in a, again, not in a like um, completely thorough way for every national statistics office in the world. So, so, so Google data set search, if anyone doesn't know, is a bit literally like what it sounds like. And uh, it's its own separate uh, uh, site from Google. But basically, you, if it's such that data sets are published on the web. And if they are marked up in uh, the right format or in, in simple, like a, a standard format that's kind of, uh, then this Google data set search can index it and then it can be searchable. So I don't have to go through web pages that hold data, but ideally I can just find data sets themselves. Um, yeah, so I searched like the Office of National Statistics does this great, and uh, I can go, I can search the ONS web, ONS website, and say ONS site employment or whatever, and th the results just pop up right away. But then I compared it with the the Central Statistics Office in Ireland, which has has very quite a nice um, portal, and it's open source software, and it's a uh, really uh, well well built, and has lots of features. But for some reason, uh, that Google data set search is not compatible with that. I don't, I'm not saying I'm not going to blame Google or the CSO on this one, but it's, again, it's, it's the, the chain of the open web there is slightly broken. You know what I mean? These things are not talking to each other and they should be ideally. Things should be linked and searchable across, uh, across them. Um, I mean, ideally them or anyone else, or Google data set search or anyone else, you would, um, you would be able to search for any data set in the world. And um, any data set, any piece of information should just, in theory, in a perfect world, 
uh, we should be able to find all those really um yeah so that was just my experience with kind of um just um playing around with which uh, nso's websites are kind of plugged in and compatible with the data set search um andy you might have other thoughts on this um i think that's a that's a good uh summary definitely i think Statistical offices um, are universally one of the most important sources of good information. And I think the fact that statistical um, offices, they in some situations are apolitical, so they're outside of government and they're publishing information about society is a very important and useful facet for fact checkers. Um, and if their information can be sourced through meta aggregators like the Google dataset search, that's really important. But one of the key things I think in the fact checking process is being able to understand where the data is coming from, how it was created and the methodology that sits behind it and ensuring that the data travels with that kind of information is incredibly important. And so at times the ability to get to a statistical office and get that data, understand where it's come from and how it's produced is incredibly, incredibly important for building up that trust that a fact checker needs with a data source. Mm. Uh, yeah, great. Thanks, Andy. Um, yeah, I may as well take the other question or another question here. It's uh, from, let me just check the name. It is from uh, Maurizio. I hope I pronounced that okay. Uh, it is, um, what are the alternative to official statistics uh, or data when viewers and readers don't trust that as a primary source? Um, I don't know uh, which person on the panel might want to take that and uh, kind of how do you, how do you handle that or what your, do you have thoughts? Um, I'm happy to jump in here and then maybe Pablo can can also comment after me because I think there may be some similar similarities between our experience of this. So I think what's being raised here is a very legitimate point, and that is in many countries around the world, there is a very low trust environment when it comes to national statistics. And that can vary just from skepticism around a certain theme or subject all the way to complete rejection of any number that is produced by government. I think, though, that there are a couple of things we need to note. Um, one, at least from our perspective, when we are fact checking in any of the African countries where we work, even if the national statistics are mostly and largely considered unreliable, we will always cite them with accompanying expert comment to explain why. Um, and that is then a starting point for almost a triangulation to say, well, this is what the national stats say. This is why it's probably not right. And let's look at other sources to see where the truth probably lies. Um, but I think that often that distrust is due to a lack of communication or understanding about national statistics and how they are calculated. Granted, there will be cases when statistics are just unreliable, but often fact checkers can do the work of explaining the process and how the sausage is made so that that trust can be regained from the public um, about those numbers. Uh, so yes, of course, we then look at other statistical sources, um, you know, not just if the national stats are unreliable, but even if they're trustworthy, we want to present all different data sources on a topic so that we can see, are they all similar or is there an outlier which suggests maybe things aren't as they seem. Uh, but I just wanna share one last anecdote that I always find really funny. And that is that often in South Africa, Kenya, Nigeria, people will say, oh no, we don't trust national statistics. We want statistics from the World Bank or from the UN you know, we, or the, we'll, we'll, we'll believe those, they're reliable. But the fact is when you go to those data sources and you look at the metadata, all that data comes from in-country surveys. Um, and it's just that stamp from the UN or the World Bank or the IMF that makes it seem credible. And I think a, a lot needs to be done to, to explain to people that there is often good statistical work being done in their countries by very experienced, knowledgeable people. Um, and those NSOs also have to do the work of depoliticizing their work, making it more transparent, including the public so that they understand the process um, so that we all can sort of meet in the middle and use this incredibly valuable resource, not just to inform policy and public opinion, but also foster and support fact checking. Um, great, thanks. Yeah. And do you also see yourself as kind of um, an explainer of the of how statistics are generated as well? Like, do you feel there's a kind of public education uh, part of fact checking as well in there? Yeah, absolutely. So 
in South Africa, that's where I have most of my experience. You will have a very detailed section on methodology in all of our statistical reports. And if you are able to understand that, you'll be able to get everything you need. But many people, most normal members of the public don't have that level of expertise. So what we have done, and it's been part of our work from the beginning, is not just to fact check, but also to produce fact sheets. And that is to produce very easy to access and understand information on key topics of debate. So employment, housing, sanitation, the economy, crime statistics, where we take data, not just from NSOs, but also other data sources. And we explain it simply without jargon in a very easy to understand way, along with the explanation of all the methodology and the technical stuff and the sampling and the weighting and the definitions. So it sort of is a bit of a bridge um, or into the statistical world so that whether you're a journalist or a civil society member or just an average member of the public who's trying to figure out whether the employment statistics sound right, there is that easy to understand information that you can access. Um, great, thanks, Kate. Um, probably dropped out for a second, but did you hear the? Did you heard the question yet on alternative to alternatives to official statistics when readers don't trust that as a primary source? I'm just wondering if you have thoughts on that. Talking to me, Vincent? yes, yes, Pablo. Yes, no, I didn't hear it, but I, I can make it with with your question. <laughs> um, in our case, we we decide. From the beginning to to base our fact checks not only in official statistics but also in, a, in alternative sources in for example universities um, unions sometimes think tanks etc 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 and that of course it needs to be balanced and need to be uh, sources that can be trusted so that creates a lot of work that it will be better to to trust in the in the ONS in our ONS, but that is not the case. So yes, for us is is that. And actually, right now the our ONS maybe in, in the last few years is is something that we can trust, but we still keep the the alternative sources as part of our methodology. Thanks. Just in case. Um. Yeah. Uh, great. Thanks, Pablo. Um, I, I did see in the chat that uh, Tasha mentioned that oh yeah, it's very useful to use external search engines and, and use them to uh, to search websites. But um, I, I, I shared the um, some slides we have, and but it's also internal uh, search and en like search engines on NSO websites can be improved as well. We're not you don't have to entirely offload everything to external things like just simple filters of. Uh, like say you are looking for a report or you are looking for um, an article or literally data sets. And so, for instance, if I search something onto the UK Office of National Statistics, I can then filter and say, actually, I want a time series or I want uh, an article or whatever. And, and so you, you kind of see if you jump around between different NSO websites, the search engines are really, really different um, and what they return uh, now, how they return information is really, really different. But in theory, they all have reports, they all have data sets, they all, you know, so like the, there's design choices going on there, but I don't know what what are they based on or why is anyone is anyone out there giving good advice to NSOs on how to design the search engine on your web website and what's returned? Um, yeah, like, and that's kind of what we've been getting at are trying, trying to find those people who uh, are making those publishing choices. Um, yeah, and uh, not so not just for search, but for all aspects of kind of putting the data up there. We're trying to find, basically trying to find them and kind of uh, convince them to um, look to look to well practiced uh, good standards around this as well. Um, yeah, um, so maybe a, a question for Andy here. So we've kind of talked about fact checkers' use of data and uh, what their um, uh, what their uh, and how they use data uh, published from NSOs. But there's also, um, I should highlight the work of kind of technology people working in uh, working in some fact checking organizations. And I, this is for um, the people at Checkiato, I guess, as well. And just if you want to, either of you or both of you want to elaborate on some of the tools that help fact checkers that can be built on better data published by NSOs. Uh, maybe we'll start with Andy. Sure. Thanks, Vincent. Um, so. 
my job title is uh, head of automated fact checking and automated fact checking is a very complicated uh, thing to try and attempt. Um, one thing I would always say about automated checking is it's always done with a human, a fact checker, a researcher, somebody in the loop. But for any form of automation or artificial intelligence um, within the world of looking at claims and verifying information, one of the most important things that's needed is really good, high quality underlying information that can be referred to. And statistics are a really important example of that. They're part of the plumbing of the web. They're one of the few places where you can rely on information and bring those in. And so the more advanced some of the publishing processes are around statistics is tools that allow us to build tools to do more interesting things. My colleague, Dr. David Corney, has done a, a pre-recorded session, which you should be able to find in the agenda um, of th this conference, look, giving a demonstration of some of the work we're doing at Full Fact to take a claim, process it in real time, identify the intention behind that claim. So is something rising or falling, identify the source. So something like inflation or um, employment figures, and then try and identify where it can go and get that information. So if it's available in such a way that a computer can ask a statistical office the answer to a question rather than having to look at some Excel spreadsheets, we can bring that back. And very quickly, we can start to identify or suggest to a fact checker who thinks something is right or wrong. There are a few other projects that have done this kind of work. So there's some great stuff from the Duke Reporters Lab. I've seen some brilliant work from different fact checkers around the world. And Pablo, I'm sure we'll talk in a moment about some of the amazing work that Chequiado have done in this space. But this idea of being able to automate any of the processes around fact checking needs this publication of good information. And so some of the things that we're trying to do that can really substantially speed up the processes of fact checking um, require this information. And I think that that speeding up is really important. We're in a world where we have just over 100,000 fact checks ever published, which is a number which we should be extraordinarily proud of as a community. But that's 100,000 versus the whole web. And so when we're trying to when we're trying to do our work, we need to take advantage of technology. And just because we're fact checkers or because we're working in small organizations doesn't mean we deserve bad technology. It means we deserve the very, very best technology because this is such a vital societal issue to try and address, which is where this whole program comes in. Improve the publishing of statistics, enable fact checkers to work harder, and the impact of our work is magnified. Um, and yeah, a really brilliant example of that is some of the work that Pablo has been doing with the wonderfully titled Czechia bot. I don't know, Pablo, if you want to give us a quick overview. Thank you, Andy. Thank you, Andy. Thanks for that. Uh, yes, and, and we, we have been working a lot also with the tech team in full fact with this. So this this has been it's it's, it's a lot of work in some way with because as, as we were discussing before, we we are celebrating like the consistency, the things that that, that in, in some countries and it's great, it, everyone took for granted. So we are our conversation is please keep this working. We're telling the people in the government that we are some of their users, and even even that we are fact checking them, <laughs> and that is that is some something great going on if they are keep not only keeping that database but adding filters and and keep moving the uh, keep improving this database or so that it can get to other parts of the government because in our case we are talking only about one specific API that give us uh, numbers from one specific part of the government. And actually, and this is like a, an anecdote, but it's important, this API is not uh, powered by the, our NSO. So it's powered by um, another ministry that wants to deal with API. So it's weird in a way, but for us it's also important. And that's why we, we also work a lot with, with Andy's team because there there is, there's a lot of great things to find the, the similar stuff and also the, the different stuff and how we can build a, a system in common in some way, at least a methodology. Um, great, thank you, Pablo. Um, I was, uh, yeah, I was just uh, had a brief look at the questions. I did see that um, Alan Leonard, um, he asked uh, what scope is there to engage in other countries with the agency responsible or agent with the agency and responsibility with responsibility for NSOs 
Um, it's quite a, as we're myself and Andy and others on the project are finding out it's because we're a data organization and um, other people in the project are fact checking organizations, trying to make your way into the world of, uh, especially at the international level of uh, national statistical offices, it's ex extremely hard because there are big, huge, um, often sometimes bureaucratic uh, world uh, that, and often they kind of operate at the, maybe the governance level or the data strategy level. Uh, and then we come, we're coming along going, uh, can you just um, maybe stick some stuff in CSVs, please? And it, it's often not what the conversation they're having, um, which is quite frustrating because like uh, we often, like I, in the research find, you know, NSOs have big flashy graphics on the front page and ticker tape and interactive visualizations, but they, they aren't, the, the basics aren't being done uh, well sometimes by some organizations. Um, yeah, and, and so, this like um, yeah, so we we've, we've had some. We're getting there. We we talked to the uh, United Nations Statistical Division recently, um, but as for which particular organizations to kind of get to and interact with, we're still feeling our way through that that world, that kind of national statistics world, and how that operates and who to talk to. I mean, if anyone knows who's a good person to talk to on this, we're well, we're all ears. But we we're making some progress with the. Uh, Good organizations like um, Paris 21 and Open Data Watch and the United Nations Statistical Division um, recently. So um, I'm sorry to say, um, uh, Alan, I don't know if I have a great answer for your question just yet. Um, um, yeah, but uh, there, there are some organizations, but i um, always open to talk, uh, talk about it as well. Um, we just have uh, only a few minutes left. Um, I'm just wondering if, um, if any of the panelists have uh, anything else they want to expand on um, regarding uh, this topic uh, that we haven't really uh, covered so far, or if, um, if there's any um, last minute questions from the audience. Um, Andy, yeah. Vincent, I have a, uh, you mentioned it at the top, but I think it's really worth uh, recalling that the impact that fact checkers can have on statistical offices, they may seem like this huge bit of apparatus of government, this kind of huge thing that's very difficult to change but having come from working in a statistical office i can't tell you just how much they crave impact stories that idea that publishing numbers are taken by people and something happens and fact checkers are such an incredible example of that because we will take this information we will use probably good information from them cite it put it into a fact check and those fact checks are then taken and used and seen by huge amounts of people Speaking from a full fact point of view, we know that our fact checks are seen hundreds of millions of times across platforms last year. And if you tell that story to a statistical institute, they will bite your hand off to work with you because they would dream of numbers like that. So I think even though we may seem like the small organization in this, we really, really have a powerful story to tell. And I'd urge people to believe that they can make a change happen here. Yeah, can, can I add but one thing, a small thing about that? And I totally, totally agree with Andy. Um, for us, it was really helpful not to find like the bureaucrat, but like the people that loves data in some way. So if you find that person in the government, uh, it's, it's great to tell the story that Andy is telling. Maybe, maybe it's not the, the guy or the girl with the best <laughs> position, but they will love the story and they will help you. Um, yeah, well, um... That is about all time. All the time we have, really. Um, just want to say uh, thanks to thanks to our panelists um, for this, and uh, big thanks to the Global Fact um, um, organizers for having us as well. Um, hope you find it really interesting. Uh, please do contact us, any of us, um, if you have thoughts on this topic. And um, yeah, I think that that's about it. Thank you very much for listening to us. Thank you. <laughs>